these pictures were received from a direct broadcast by satellite. One day, we may all be receiving such transmissions at home, and direct broadcasting by satellite could change the face of television as we know it today. In 1975, NASA launched the ATS-6 satellite, broadcasting an experimental television service to the Indian subcontinent. At that time, a DXTV enthusiast in Sheffield saw this as a challenge he couldn't ignore. With the signal strength in theory 30 dBs down on the main footprint over India, Steve Burkill was to succeed in resolving those transmissions using only surplus and home engineered equipment. He's now able to watch pictures of this quality from a Russian Gorizont 4 communications satellite. The heart of the system is the head unit. Steve explains. Feed horn, this is a scalar horn, which uh, is a variable beam with feed. Um, it um, feeds into a circular waveguide. Uh, this section here is a polarizer. These um, stubs will produce circular polarization or um, produce linear from circular polarization, dependent on the orientation. This is the actual feed probe, which is a waveguide to coax transition. 12 gigahertz signal comes out of here, then um, coax to microstrip transition. Uh, FET amplifier, gallium arsenide FET in microstrip, first stage, likewise second stage. Uh, mixer in strip line, gun local oscillator on the low side of the signal. No, it's on the high side, in fact, in this one. Um, first IF comes out here, IF head amplifier in there, first IF 450 to 950 megs. This is a wideband IF amplifier, 21 dB, 450 to 950. Uh, output comes out here to feed to the house and 12 volt supply from the house goes in here. Um, the, the rest are just bias circuitry for the, um, for the FED stages. This is for the, the OTS um, feed, which um, is Brian Haynes' transmission this week, his test transmissions yeah. to Europe. I presume we need to make obvious to people that 12 gigs are really meant for broadcasters to pick up and receive from, whereas a 4 gig one, the yeah, broadcasting I mean, orbit is actually meant for the viewers to look at direct. OTS it? transmits in, uh, in the 11 to 12 gigs band. It, it's sitting at a frequency which is allocated for the fixed satellite service, but uh, the eventual broadcast satellite service at 12 gigahertz is in a very close frequency band to this. We're talking about a 2.5 centimetre wavelength. And um, it'll be a similar head unit to this, except it will be rather more cosmetic. That uh, will be used for DBS services within Europe, and in the States for that matter, when they, when they start. This sensitive piece of equipment is protected from the elements by nothing more exotic than a plastic dustbin liner. The dish tracking system is simple but effective. It consists of Steve watching his own spectrum analyzer in the kitchen through the center of the dish, whilst adjusting the elevation and azimuth of the dish for maximum signal. A closer look at the spectrum analyzer reveals the satellite activity on the band. And, uh, because of its, um, of its uh, signal strength, they, they put energy dispersal on it, but it's a fairly unusual one because it's a, it's a 2 hertz triangular waveform and the uh, total deviation is about 5 megahertz or more. Why do they do that? I can't think of that. It reduces the, um, the spectral energy at, at any one frequency. The, um, the other channels, uh, this, this one is Northern Hemisphere. Again, this is, this is my estimation because uh, the published information is a bit uh, thin on the ground and not very reliable. Uh, this is uh, Northern Hemisphere and this is uh, Global Beam. By Global Beam, I mean uh, it illuminates the, the visible Earth as seen by the satellite. And this, this thing is just the, the marker to indicate where I'm tuned 
These pictures are from a Saudi Arabian communication satellite and are representative of what is possible at the limits of the system. The signal being a hundred times weaker than the earlier Russian signal is comparable with the original results from the Indian satellite and was received on the Mark I equipment. This was my satellite receiver for period 1978 <laughs> to um, 1981. And this, this modular receiver took over in, uh, in mid-81 and is, is of course, uh, capable of rather better... I, I mean, I only built that because from having access to signals of this sort of strength, I suddenly found I had access to signals that with an 8-foot dish would yield uh, full quieting, um, like the Russian like OTS. So obviously I, I needed to, um, to take advantage of the better performance I could get. So I wanted a receiver with something approaching professional spec rather than this which is all right as a narrowband receiver for experimental reception to see whether there's something there and what can be made of it. How much, how much are you now in a band by? Well it's it's variable bandwidth on this the, the phase lock loop is uh, is operated below limiting so the actual noise bandwidth depends on how hard you drive it so it'll narrow uh, at maximum it, it stretches to about 15 or 20 megs it'll narrow up to about 1 megahertz uh, if I wanted to. I'm probably operating at something like 3 here. The Mark II equipment offers greater flexibility. OK, it comes in at UHF. Have no more to eat and I shouldn't give my secrets away like this. Uh, UHF wideband amplifier, 450 is the range we're interested in. It splits in 3 dB hybrid uh, to 2 dB down converter, switch selectable, um, full band and a narrow band with special AFC for the Russian energy dispersal. Uh, the uh, IF outputs of these at 70 megs, selected by relay in here, 70 meg variable gain amplifier to set IF gain. Uh, comes out of here through a 70 meg filter, 25 megs bandwidth, uh, 3 dB bandwidth, to define the noise bandwidth of the system. And then into a 70 megs IF amplifier, about 30 dB gain. Um, from there into the video demodulator, an AFC unit, uh, whose outputs include the um, subcarriers, the audio subcarriers, the video switchable polarity, and uh, the AFC, which is fed back to the uh, down converter. Uh, the audio is um, up converted, local oscillator and up converter, uh, double balance mixer in here. Um, the digital frequency meter on the front reads the local oscillator frequency less 10.7 meg. The 10.7 output from here goes into a commercial 10.7 meg audio demod. Uh, and then we have an expander for the Russian pilot tone compounding system. I think that's it. Um, and a commercial UHF modulator feed a standard TV. The sound is transmitted on a subcarrier at the top end of the baseband, um, which is a, an FM subcarrier. Uh, wideband FM, similar to uh, your standard intercarrier sound. But um, the subcarrier they're using on this transmission is about 6.6 .6 megahertz instead of your 6, which is standard for the UK, or 5.5 for Western Europe. Um, 6.6 .6 is what they're using. I don't know why. Um, I think it's probably just... No, I don't know the answer why they're using that. It's a standard frequency that's used on OTS. I've seen it on OTS before. But uh, by comparison, the Russians use 7 megs or 7.5. So I've got a, a tunable intercarrier D mod in here, um, which takes the top end of the baseband, uh, heterodynes it up to 10.7 megs, and uh, demodulates it with uh, the sort of technology you find in an FM receiver. It started to rain and the man this is a test transmission from the UK-based Satellite TV Limited on 12 gigahertz via OTS-2. OTS-2 is a communication satellite being used to evaluate a European direct broadcast service. These signals are noisier than would normally be expected. This is probably because the test involved a low-powered uplink to the satellite. It must be pointed out that further degradation of the pictures occurred due to multi-generation recording impairments. Steve's pioneering efforts may soon bear fruit commercially in the USA when he takes up his new position in research and development into a viable home system. <laughs>